We have a special edition of the Land and Bussy Radio Show and Meet and Greet live here at the Turkey Lake Shack located here in beautiful downtown Vicksburg. Glad you can join us. Last week at this time, we talked some Braves football. Today, Braves basketball with head coach Landon Bussey. He's here, and you can join the conversation. You can give us a call at 601-877-6595. You can text a question during the show, 601-348-7254. And you can tweet a question. I'm on Twitter, Tall Man Radio. A lot to unpack, a lot to discuss. COVID-19, the previous season, Landon Bussey's first season as head men's basketball coach. It was an interesting one, to say the least. The roster, there will be a lot of new faces to talk about. We'll talk about some of the old faces. Will they be coming back? The transfer portal, philosophy in terms of building a program. And, of course, he's here soliciting a lot of support and donations. He'll talk about that as well. And, of course, tomorrow we officially bring in Florida a and and Bethune-Cookman. The SWAC schedule has changed. Our travel partner in basketball has changed. We'll talk all about it with head coach Landon Bussey. Glad you can join us here on 91.7 WPRL and on the World Wide Web, WPRL.org. We are live here in Vicksburg, downtown Vicksburg, 1412 Washington Street, home of the Turkey Leg Shack. All-you-can-eat lunch buffet every weekday. It's got some good food, got some good stuff. We'll talk to the owner as well. So we'll get it all started after this one-minute timeout here from Vicksburg, here on the Alcorn Sports Radio Network. Load up the family and head to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Vicksburg has so much to offer, from beautiful parks to one-of-a-kind restaurants with astounding food and breathtaking views. And of course, around every corner, there's fun waiting for you. Come visit Vicksburg and see for yourself why it's not only called the key to the south, but you can also call it home. Vicksburg, Mississippi, a fun place to visit, a great place to live. And welcome to Vicksburg, Mississippi, the Land and Bussy Radio Program, live on location here at the Turkey Leg Shack, located at 1412 Washington Street here in beautiful downtown Vicksburg. Glad you can join us here on 91.7 WPRL and on the World Wide Web, WPRL.org. We are on TuneIn Radio. You go to TuneIn.com and type in Life 91.7 WPRL, and you can check us out. We're talking a little Braves basketball here on this Wednesday with Braves head basketball coach Landon Bussey. You can give us a call during the hour, 601-877-6595. You can text a question, 601-348-7254, or you can tweet a question. I'm on Twitter, Tall Man Radio. Head coach Landon Bussey to my left joining us. Coach, I appreciate the opportunity here on this Wednesday to talk a little Braves basketball. How you doing? I'm doing well, can't complain. Well. I guess, as they say, if you do, is it going to make any difference? <laughs> no difference, right? Right, correct. You got to keep plowing forward, and, and that's where you are right now, trying to look forward to the upcoming season. Before we do that, let's look back a little bit. Are you, uh, was last season amongst COVID-19, was a season to remember, or was it a season to forget? Um, it was a season to learn from. Um, there was a lot of challenges we faced as a team and at university and at, you know, it's a worldwide pandemic, so it was just something that we learned from and moved forward, and you know, hopefully, moving forward, that you know, we able to play some more games. What was the biggest thing that you learned as a coach, as a person, dealing with young people traveling? We had six games in a row canceled in non-conference, a number of games in conference uh, canceled due to COVID-19 issues. What did you learn about yourself? Learn about your team as a coach, as an individual? Um, I think the on and off really hurt us. Um, just on and off, stopping and starting and stopping and starting. I think their bodies didn't respond to that well. Um, but I do think that they've, any obstacle that, you know, was thrown at us, we, you know, we try to handle it best as possible. But I do think that the stops and starts hurt us throughout the, you know, duration of the season um, and it impacted their bodies. And with all the traveling that we all had to do, most of us had to do, uh, of course, in non-conference, you know, that, that's kind of a tricky thing because you, you lost six games in a row. You added university 
of Houston. You added Baylor. You added Vanderbilt. I mean, you had some tough games that you lost and tough games added. Just talk about that transition and trying to keep your team as focused and as ready as possible, knowing that at any point in time a game could be canceled and you're trying to add games. Well, it's not just any game. I mean, we're going up against two Final Four teams in Baylor and University of Houston. So after we got um, back from our break of COVID, you know, first team we played, I think, was Houston. Um, and then after that, we played Baylor. So to me, you know, it's just a challenge, um, something you learn from. Um, we probably got some of the similar same type of teams we played this year on our schedule. But, um, you know, it was really tough for us. But like I said, you know, we made it through it. And, you know, it's light at the end of the tunnel. I appreciate uh, being here and being a part of this. And, you know, we had your show a little bit during the spring and just getting to meet and talk with all the alums, a good turnout here at the uh, at the Turkey Lake Shack. Just talk about the engagement as you talk with Braves fans locally and all over the country, trying to add and build your, your program and trying to get kids in, especially during these times. Uh, well, that's why we really wanted to try to tap into the um, Mississippi area and recruit a lot of different Mississippi kids. Um, to you know, keep some of these you know better talent closer to home, so that was very important to us um, with this incoming recruiting class, um, especially all the stuff that's going on in the world. It was important for us to try to keep the kids closer to home. So when you look at this state, the state of Mississippi in basketball, we know this state produces a lot of great football players, but when you look at basketball, when you look at what we've done in the past, and you look at what you're trying to do here, how would you assess the talent pool? in the state of Mississippi? Well, I think it's a lot of talent here. Um, it's a lot of good players who's hungry, a lot of good players who got a little grit to them, um, and a lot of good players who's motivated. So, um, I mean, some good players, you just gotta find out, you know, what's right for your system, what's right for your program, and um, hopefully they come in and help impact the program. We get a chance to talk quite often, and just getting to, to know you, I remember the first practice that I got a chance to attend, uh, maybe your first week, it was intense, the players weren't focused and they were quiet and it was like you said are we practicing or are we having a funeral here you like intensity mm -hmm. you like energy just give fans a sense who are just still trying to get to know landon bussey the coach even though this is will be your second season the type of style that you like the way you like to get it done to get the most out of everyone well i think um you know for the most part the people who have came by any practice um they know that my intensity um, and what I bring every single day in practice in, this, in the games. Um, and I try to get that to, you know, trickle down to our players. Um, and that's what we really want to focus on recruiting. Guys who are motivated, guys who come with intensity, guys who are passionate about the, and love the game of basketball. Um, last year, you know, I had to try to motivate them guys a little bit as far as in practice and games just to um, have some intensity. So this year we try to do a better job of recruiting those type of guys who fit the same mindset and the same belief of, of our program. The buy-in. I ask every single first-year coach this, and I hear this all the time, whether it's a pro coach, a high school coach, or a college coach. The toughest thing to me, from what I can tell, is players buying in to a new system, a new coach, a new way of doing business. How was that for you? I think it went well. It, went well. Um, it's diff it was difficult in the beginning. Um, some of the you know former players, they was you know used to different ways. Um, and so me coming in, just getting the buy-in, it was a little difficult. But I believe that, you know, during the duration of the season, they start to figure out that it works. And they start to figure out the buy-in, and they start to figure out that um, you're going to have the buy-in if you plan on being successful here. But there is a challenging part, but I th do think that we was able to um, get a lot of guys to buy-in throughout the season. Of course, when you were at Prairie View, you were, for a period of time, the women's coach there. Being a first-time men's coach, talk about the challenges there when you're dealing with those two situations? Um, it wasn't hard for me to adapt at all. Um, just, you know, coaching the game of basketball, coach if it's women or men, I was just, you know, pretty good at just um, reaching out to the players and building a relationship with them and getting them to respond. So it wasn't too much of a transition for me. Um, of course, you know, me moving over to the men's side, um, you know, I was able to, you know, challenge them a little more, get on them a little tougher. So that was the only difference, but, you know, I enjoy coaching both sides. We talked about this, before we went on, it was a tough season, obviously. A lot mm -hmm. of games lost, a lot of games lost due to COVID-19 for whatever, you know, whatever the reasons. But injuries were also a big factor. And maybe a lot of people did not know that there was only two games 
during the course of last season in which you had your full roster and you're saying, man, are we ever going to be totally healthy? And we were for two games. And that was during a period of conference play in which we started to play a little bit better. I know you're not a coach of excuses. COVID-19, I don't know how you want to define that excuse or not. Some people say, you know, you got to plow forward, but we weren't healthy. Uh, how talk about dealing with, with that a little bit and how we're able to fight through that? Um, I think I just dealt with the stop and starts. Um, we stopped for two weeks, then we played for two weeks. We stopped here, we stopped there um, just due to COVID. Um, and it, like I said, impacted my guys' bodies. Um, we only probably had two, I think, two games to where as though um, we had a full team. Um, other than that, you know, we had guys sitting out due to COVID, had guys injured, um, guys suspended. Um, or whatever the case may be. But, you know, those two games, I do feel as though we start to turn the corner. But <laughs> as soon as that happened, I think um, I think Arnie Morris ended up getting injured. Um, then I think Tremaine ended up getting injured. Then Justin Thomas get, ended up getting injured. So, But, you know, I tell my guys, the next man up mentality. Um, you got to be prepared to play when your number is called. So uh, we didn't make any excuses. And, you know, whatever guys that was out there ready for practice in the game, you know, my coaching staff and I try to coach them as hard as possible. We're talking with head coach Landon Bussey. You can join the conversation, 601-877-6595. You can text a question, 601-348-7254. You can tweet a question. I'm on Twitter, Tall Man Radio. We're going to take a break right here. When we come back, we're going to talk about one of the biggest issues, if not the biggest issue that's dealing uh, that we're dealing with with collegiate athletics which is the transfer portal. It's busting at the seams. It is for football. It is for basketball. Interesting numbers I was able to dive into earlier, and we'll get into that. And when you look at this Braves roster, it's going to be uh, some of some transfers there. And we had some players leave this program as well on the other side. So we're dealing with both ends of it. Every program is dealing with it, and we'll talk about it with head coach Landon Bussey. We'll take a one-minute timeout. Glad you can join us, however way you may be checking us out, whether listening and or watching. We'll take a break. We'll be right back after this. Time out. Once you get to Alcorn, it's kind of like there's a place for everybody. I fell in love with the people. Overall, I just, I, I love the experience, whether it's personal, whether it's in education. Anywhere you turn, there's always a helping hand. People just going up and asking you, hey, are you new? Are you lost? You know, and taking an interest. I would tell students if they want to be challenged to learn and grow and be in an environment that is nurturing and a place where they're not just a number, where people know you by name, then I would tell them to come to Alcorn. You don't fight fair, so we'll just fight harder. We didn't come here to play around. You're going down. Honestly, I hate you. I'm stronger than you. I'm more determined than you. We're going to beat you, cancer. Because the American Cancer Society is on our team. And together, we're unstoppable. My name is John Calipari. I'm Roy Williams. I'm Jim Behan. I'm Tubby Smith. And I'm a coach versus cancer. Welcome back. We are live here in Vicksburg at the Turkey Leg Shack here in Vicksburg, Mississippi, downtown Vicksburg, 1412 Washington Street. This area, know it well. I, we used to live downstairs right below this location, and uh, downtown is definitely improving and bustling, and uh, glad to be here. We are joined by Braves head coach Landon Bussey. Meet and greet slash uh, Landon Bussey radio program. Coach, you called me a couple of weeks ago about this event and uh, wanted to turn it into kind of a Q&A and talk a little bit about your program. Just, just talk about meeting and engaging and meeting and greeting the folks, the good folks here in Vicksburg. Absolutely, absolutely. So we just wanted, we just wanted to, you know, come out and have a meet and greet, um, being that I didn't have the opportunity to meet um, some of the special people who um, were ready from all corn administration, um, just the fans um, due to COVID. So we just wanted to come have a little meet and greet and then you know to try to build relationships and um, get involved with the community well let's talk a little bit about one of the biggest issues coach obviously the transfer portal and it's a it's a conversation that's been had it's been a lot of anger a lot of frustration uh, I have heard folks say that this is nothing more than free agency <laughs> Whether it's football, something like that, yeah. Whether it's basketball, do you agree or disagree with that notion? I agree. I mean, it's pretty much it's happening everywhere. I mean, I think that right now it's still, I think it's probably about seventeen hundred to two thousand, anywhere between um, Division One college basketball players transferring. So, 
It's a lot. It's a lot. And if you look at the numbers, and I got a chance to look it up a little earlier today, according to NCA.com, there were, this is college basketball, 689 transfers in 2017, 704 players in 2018, 694 players in 2019, and according to this article, it was June 30th, of 1,573 players listed, almost half of the 753 players have yet to find a place to play. So that's the other tough part of this in terms of players that do transfer out, trying to find a home. Where do you see this going? What, what's, what's the end game of all this? I'm sure there will be at some point in time. How do you think this thing's gonna end? Is it gonna crash and burn or do you see some sort of workable solution to this? Um, I think the NCAA is going to figure it out and uh, find a solution. But there's a lot of student athletes who are going to be left without nothing. Um, they put their name in the transfer portal, um, and they, they don't have nowhere to go. So I do think a lot of student athletes are going to be left without nothing. But I do think the NCAA is going to figure it out in the future, because right now it's just you know way too many kids transferring, way too many kids, um, you know, not trying to work it out, figure it out, um, and just jump into that transfer portal, and they think the grass is green on the other side. So I do think that the NCAA is going to figure it out. What are those conversations like when a player comes to you with with the whole transfer thing? Do you get the conversation on the front end, Coach, I'm thinking about transferring, or do you get it on the back end where you find out they're heading out? Well, I don't think just the, the transfer portal is just the um, student athletes wanting to transfer. I think that sometimes the – um, the coaching staff just believe that for the student athlete, it might be a benefit for them to go somewhere else. So I think it's mutual. Um, but with my situation, um, you know, I give all my student athletes the opportunity to um, share about how the season went and just, you know, let them know, you know, wh what are you, what are you playing? And um, my job here is to um, try to keep the players coming back and retain. Um, but I'm not going to stop anybody who feels as though they want to go to another situation. Um, so I pretty much with my student athletes who decided they wanted to transfer or they decided it wasn't a good fit or move closer to home, um, they pretty much were straightforward and honest with me and explained to me the reason why they wanted to um, go in a different direction. I asked this to Coach McNair last week. You see this being a product of maybe student athletes doing a good job in the classroom where you have two clocks. You've got the academic clock, then you've got the athlete clock, five years before, whatever it is. and kids are getting their degree early and they have three years of eligibility like we've seen in, in a lot of cases. Do, do you see the clock changing with this with the transfer portal rules in which they're getting their degree, they're going to class and they've got a lot of eligibility left and now they got opportunities and options? Well, I think the clock is going to change just due to um, this COVID year. The NCAA allowed this year to come back. So, um, and that's for freshmen, sophomores, juniors and seniors. So the clock has to change at least one additional year just due to, um, you know, they're allowing these kids to get this additional year and don't count this towards their eligibility. So in the moving forward, um, it hurt a lot of high school kids as well, being that um, all your seniors, juniors, and your, your underclassmen, they're able to come back. So I do think that the NCAA is going to allow them to get an additional year um, towards their clock. How do you feel about, the, you know, the high school kids in terms of, you know, they're just doing their part and playing the game and, they're ready to take that next step to the collegiate level. How is that impacting them from what you've seen? Um, it sucks for them. It, I feel bad for them um, just due to a lot of the high school kids, they're going to be left without anything. They want to have to go you know, a different route to try to get to that next level. Um, but, you know, it's just something that we're dealing with nationwide. Um, I feel bad for some of the seniors who, you know, didn't get opportunity to play that much this season. I know a few universities and conferences, um, they canceled their season. So. Um, I feel bad for both parties. We're talking with head coach Landon Bussey here on the Landon Bussey radio program, a special edition here at the Turkey Leg Shack, 1412 Washington Street here in Vicksburg. All right, so let's talk about the roster, coach. We're going to talk about what we're going to expect going forward for this upcoming season, an exciting season. But when you look at this roster with Tremaine Crosby and Kirk Lee and Myson Lowe, David Pierce, Anthony Fairley, and these are the guys that play this year, Tyree Corbett, Kobe Wilson, uh, uh, Tash Fraley with Kadrian Thorne, Otis Walker, Malik Hardman, Justin Thomas, Mark Carter, KJ Riley, Arnie Morris, and Byron Joshua. When you look at this roster, you look at a guy like Tremaine Crosby, who was one of the top players 
in the conference, I thought maybe a player of the year candidate. Talk about some of these guys who will be returning and some that will not be returning because the options are there as we talked about. He could have come back if there are opportunities there to maybe play at the next level, we looked at all of that. So just give us a sense in terms of uh, who will not be coming back. Uh, well, Crosby is one of the main guys who really um, decided to um, try to pursue his options elsewhere. So I think he's in the process now of trying to play professional basketball. Um, but he was an impact guy, um, could have been played a year, um, very skilled on both sides of the ball, um, outstanding person, outstanding student. So um, I take my hat off to him and hopefully that, you know, he's able to get to that next level and play professional basketball. Um, and then you have um, David Pierce, um, who decided to transfer close to the home. Um, he had a lot of issues that took place throughout this year with his family. Um, and he thought it was best for him to just, you know, move closer to home. Um, Kirk Lee, is the, he graduated. Um, Jacoby Ross graduated, so both of them are grad transfers. Um, and who else? Arnie, he decided to move closer to home as well. All right, so you look at this roster. You, you look at the opportunities, the scholarships available. How many scholarships are available here with this team? Right now mm -hmm. or? Right now. The beginning. <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, I don't know. You got to ask Mr. Russ. Mr. Russ saying one. I think it's three. No, <laughs> no, no. I got three. So, but no, I think I got two scholarships available right now. Um, and just trying to, you know, hold those two scholarships for two impact type of players, some two program changes coming right away and um, make a huge impact to the program. I talked with Coach McNair about this last week, and I read an article in which the way this is going with the transfer portal, if things don't change, especially in football and maybe at the FBS level, coaches might hold back eight or nine or ten scholarships because they look at the portal and see some guys that can impact them right away. Do you, you kind of see that in basketball? Yeah, I'm just holding back too. Um, and those two guys are going to be two impact type of players. I do think we got a good returning group coming back. Um, we had a good uh, signing class. Um, but it's those last two is going to be the two impact guys who will come in right away and um, impact this program. So when you look at impact, you look at needs going into this upcoming season, a tough schedule playing some of the top teams in the country, Gonzaga, Baylor, the defending national champs. What were the needs? What were some of the things that you really needed? Big, small, mids, all of it? Well, the first thing that you look at is you're losing 19.6 rebounds a game from Crosby. That's just one person. So that's the first need to try to fill them shoes, which is going to be extremely hard to do. Um, just what he brought to the table on and off the court, his leadership, um, his work ethic. It's going to be really hard to um, replace that 19 points and six rebounds a game. Um, so that's the first need. Um, and we wanted to get bigger. Um, I felt as though last year that we got out rebounded, we got pushed around a lot. So we made a huge emphasis on getting bigger um, and being more depth in the post players. Another thing is that, you know, our perimeter scoring. Um, last year, we struggled scoring the ball. As you know, Mr. Charles, <laughs> we talked about all the time. You go look at our roster. We didn't win any games if a team scored over 60 points throughout the whole year. Even though we prided ourselves on the defensive end, we had a hard time scoring the ball. So we put an emphasis on getting more perimeter scoring, put an emphasis on getting bigger and stronger, and um, you know, just, just overall just becoming tougher and um, more guys who are you know, just tougher, um, hopefully um, bring a lot more intensity and passion and has um, just the mindset on the defensive end, but also can score the ball. You look at the swag right now, obviously Texas Southern, and you talked about the transfer portal. Their player of the year, Michael Weathers, uh, is transferring. Um, I think his fourth school in four years, I believe. Oklahoma State transfer, came to Texas Southern. Now he's at SMU, I believe. So you, 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 you look at that and you look at the style, you look at this conference, and, and what does it take? I mean, Texas Southern won the, won the tournament. You look at Jackson State and what they did. You look at Texas Southern and what they did. Of course, Prairie View was there as well. When fans look at a championship roster, when they look at what it takes defensively, and you pride on defense, of course, scoring, is, is, uh, is this a scoring league? Is this a defensive league now is what you saw a few years ago? How, how would you assess the formula to winning a SWAC basketball championship? Um, I think it changes each year. I think last year you had to score the ball in Texas Southern. They were the best team that could score the ball. Um, the, pr the prior year was, you know, Prairie View um, defense. Um, they led teams, you know, they held teams under 65 points. 
Um, but I'm always going to stand on defense. Um, we got to guard. We got to get stops. Uh, we got to buy onto the defensive end. But I do think that this league is pretty much each year could it it could translate. I mean, one year could be offense. Th- one year could be defense. Um, but that's why it's going to be important for us to find guys that can play both sides of the ball. Um, I know that our practices are going to be tough. It's going to be defensive basis. But we do got to have guys that can score the ball. Um, and I think that's what we struggled at this year. And how will that roster look like, you ask? We have questions. Landon Bussey has answers. He talked about the guys that have left, left the program. He'll talk about what we've got coming in. We'll get to that coming up. Your text tweets questions from the audience here at the Turkey Leg Shack here in Vicksburg. Glad you can join us. However well you may be checking us out, watching and or listening, we'll take a break. We'll be right back after this Time Out here on the Brave Sports Network. Alcorn is honestly just, it's, it's, it's truly, when I think of Alcorn, I think of family. I would encourage people to come to Alcorn because if you're looking for a great way to connect with people, to also um, get your degree, and also to um, enjoy college, I would definitely choose Alcorn. If they made the choice to come to Alcorn, they wouldn't regret it. You would just meet so many great people that would have a lasting impression on your life. And the teachers and everything, it's just a family. And it's a great family to be a part of because once you're part of the Brave Nation, you just can't forget it, you can't let it go. Be brave, go further. We are Alcorn. Choose to be brave. Choose Alcorn. Alcorn proud, brave strong. Alcorn is where you belong. Redman here with Braves head coach Landon Bussey, the Landon Bussey radio program. Glad you can join us here. We are live at the Turkey Lake Shack here in downtown Vicksburg, 1412 Washington Street here in beautiful downtown Vicksburg. We're going to have a big 4th of July celebration uh, coming up here downtown uh, for the 4th of July. Downtown is uh, bustling and growing. I've lived uh, right beneath this place here, Landon Bussey in downtown Vicksburg. Just talk about moving here to Mississippi and here in, here in Vicksburg and, and matriculating around town here? Um, I, I enjoy it so far. Um, came from Houston, Texas, so um, a little, little adjustment, but so far I'm enjoying it. Um, the atmosphere, the people, the environment, and everything, the food has been great, so I'm enjoying it. We always talk about the restaurants here in this in, in this town and just trying to find a, find a good place to eat. There's some new restaurants on the horizon coming here, and uh, as a person that likes to eat myself, I'm definitely going to enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, you talk about building a program, all right? So back, way back when, you know, coaches like to build programs, freshmen, you know, you get a bunch of freshmen, let them grow, let them play, let them develop. But your philosophy is a little bit different. You and I have talked about this, you know, on several occasions. What is the land and bussy philosophy in terms of building a basketball program? Is it getting a bunch of freshmen, let them grow up? Is the landscape change to where you can't do that now with the transfer portal you got grad transfers you've got you know guys moving around what is what is your philosophy because at Prairie View when you were assistant you won two straight championships before you arrived here so what what is your philosophy in terms of building a program um, I think the NCAA made it tough for you to uh, really recruit freshmen um, just due to so you know just transfer portal you know, everybody's dealing with it, you know, how, how quick the student athletes are, you know, just transferring. Um, but we did recruit um, some younger kids this year um, from the Mississippi area who we believe that will come here, be impact players here for four years and um, should have outstanding careers here. So um, try to have a different bu- bu- variation. Um, grad transfers, Division One transfers, junior college transfer, high school players um, mixed with the returning players. So. Hopefully you fit everything together. Hopefully it, it comes out pretty good. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, talk about some of the players coming in as Braves fans can can get to know those folks and uh, be aware of of the upcoming roster. Um, okay, yeah. First guy is um, Devin Carter, who led the state in scoring from uh, Florence High School. Um, he's a six-two guard. Um, averaged probably about twenty-eight points this year. Um, he can score the ball at all three levels. Um, tough. Um, can play off the ball, play on the ball, play both sides of the ball. Um, we're very excited about him. 
And then you have transfer um, Keandre Montgomery from Mississippi State, went to Forest Hill High School. Um, he's coming in. He'll be a freshman um, due to this year to encounter. He's 6'7", probably weigh about 190 pounds, um, athletic, um, you know, play both sides of the ball, um, can really score the ball. Then you have Ladarius Marshall transfer from um, University of New Orleans. He's from Jackson, Mississippi as well. Um, he went to Forest Hill, 6'7", athletic post player um, who, you know, extremely athletic, gets over the rim, protects the rim. Um, he's going to be very, very impactful for us. I don't think that we had this here in a while, just his athleticism and his toughness and um, what he brings to the table. Um, then you have Darius Agnew. Um, he was from Starkville, Mississippi, transferred from Southeast Missouri, grad transfer, 6'8". Um, very skilled, can score on the block, um, can get from the ball. He can close out the game for you. And as far as his finesse and his, his touch and his skill set. Um, then you have Dontrell McCorders, transfer from Ryder. Um, but he's from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's six seven, six eight. Um, he plays at he played at Heinz Community College. Um, can play both sides of the ball, athletic, and you know just versatility. Um, he averaged nine point six rebounds at Ryder. Um, and then we have Dominique Bruton coming back, um, who played for us la the year before last, and he went to junior college. Now he's coming back, six three guard from Ohio, um, who can score the ball at all three levels and close out the game for you. D.J. Bruton is a kid that I really hate left the program a couple of years ago. I thought he was really coming along as a youngster, just trying to figure it out. Um, went back to uh, Ohio and then came back. Talk about just getting him getting him in, in the fold because he's been familiar and really was a pretty good score for us. Absolutely. Um, he's a really good scorer. And, you know, before he left, I tried to convince him to stay. But he wanted to shop around and go to junior college. But we're excited to have him back. He can really score the ball. He could get going at a very high level. Um, can score the ball off the bounce, catch and shoot, coming off a curl, down screen, pin down. He can score the ball all three levels. So we're excited to get him back, and he's going to bring a lot of a lot of offense to us this year. You and I talked about the whole recruiting thing amongst COVID-19 uh, during the course of the season, how tough it was with Zoom and all that, and how mm -hmm. you like to be in the gym and you like to deal with things, you know, more face to face. Sounds like you have a good class, a lot of in-state talent. Uh, Talk about the difficulties and challenges of dealing with that. I mean, you got a good class, but you yet it's still a, it was still a challenge this year. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, but being that they was in state, um, I think they feel more comfortable um, being closer to home. The only kid that's out of state is um, DJ Bruton, um, and he pretty much was already <laughs> here, so he understands you know what it takes to be successful at this level, what it takes to be successful at Alcorn, and then you have. Uh, Don Trump McCorder, who's from Baton Rouge, who's two, three hours away. So being that it was in state, um, I felt as though these kids, they felt more com comfortable coming closer to home, playing here and help build this program back up to be a championship program. All right, uh, we have a question here uh, in the audience. Got a couple of questions. Okay. A couple of questions, okay. Yeah, that's good. Good evening, Coach. Uh, my question is, um, how many projected returning starters from last year's roster are returning? And the second part of that is, did you have a very good recruiting year? Um, to answer your first part is three. Um, Byron Joshua, who started for us um, from New Orleans, Louisiana. Justin Thomas, who started for us this year, transferred from Moorhead State. And Otis Walker, transferred from Stephen F. Austin, who started for us this year from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we're returning three starters, um, and then we're returning three guys who came off the bench who made huge impact for us. I tell you what, you talk about Justin Thomas. Uh, mm -hmm. Came in right around conference time and really was an impact guy right away. I mean, getting those guys to come in right when conference play starts and getting them acclimated to your system, I thought he did a real nice job and made some nice plays and, some, and knocked down some shots for us. He did. Um, he came in right away in the middle of the season. And I think he got there in December or January, and he, you know, flew right in, ready to play. Um, we was able to get him eligible, get him situated. But um, he, he didn't have time to adapt to me. He didn't have time to adapt to my coaching, to the program, to the culture, or anything. But he stepped foot in, and he played some huge minutes for us. So we're excited to get him back with his experience, his leadership. Um, he's a really good player, and I think that now he's coming in, he'll have time to condition, he'll have time to – I mean, he didn't even come into practice. 
I mean, he just came right in and we just played him um, because he was just so, you know, talented. And he brought a lot to the table. But I do think now that he has time to practice and do conditioning and, and he knows what I'm looking for. He knows my expectation. I think that he's going to emerge even more. All right, Joe, we appreciate that question. We have another question here. Hey, Coach, you talk about how you're holding out for two major impact players. So my question to you for people that may be listening, how long do you hold out for those impact players? What's your deadline? What's your cutoff? Um, I don't have a deadline unless Mr. Russ give me one. <laughs> um, I'll wait to the very last minute until school start up if we can get them in school. So um, I'm not, I don't have a deadline, just depending on what the, what the fit. Um, if those kids come in, if they can fit, um, do they fit into the buy-in? Are they going to fit into the culture? And how much do I believe that they can impact this program? And I know this is a hot button question. A lot of us have been talking about it, but do you believe the name, image, and likeness will affect players going into the transfer portal even more? Someone just asked me that. I do think it is. I do think it, but I don't think that it would, me personally, I don't think it would affect us. Um, I think it's going to start at the high, higher level as far as SEC, Big 12, ACC. But right now, I don't think it would affect um, HBCUs. And that was, that was kind of on my plate to that talk about next, Coach, the uh, name, image, and likeness. Your thoughts on that? I mean, Congress obviously has done their part. The states are doing their part. And I'm reading all kinds of uh, stuff from the SEC schools in terms of what you can and can't do. And, you know, we need to talk to attorneys and all that stuff. What are your thoughts on, first of all, this whole name, image, and likeness thing taking off the way that it has? Um, I think it's just an opportunity for the student athletes to, you know, put money in their pockets. I mean, I think it's good for them. But like I was t telling um, Sam earlier, I don't think that it's going to affect us right now. Um, I think that eventually it will come back to affect us. But I think it's going to start st at the top with the um, Power Five schools. Then it'll work their way down um, with us. But I think it's a good way for uh, you know the athletes now to, you know, gain some income and pocket some pocket money. And this just goes to what we've been talking about, the transfer portal, options and opportunities, just another option for, for, these, uh, for these student athletes in, in all sports. How does that you know, impact you as a coach, knowing that at any point in time this, this, this thing could change, really, on a year-to-year -year basis, players coming in, players going out? How does this change the way you, you do business and how coaches do, do their business, knowing that their roster could change each and every year, at least for the short term? Um, I try not to let it affect me too much. Just try to focus on the guys who want to be here. That's my biggest thing is, you know, guys who want to be here, who want to be a part of all four in the tradition. I don't try to beg nobody to come. I don't try to beg nobody to stay. Um, I focus on guys who want to be here. Um, but I do think that, you know, with this going on, I do think that all these student athletes, they're going to start to go to different places where they, where they feel as though they can make a more income um, for their self. And it could affect the transfer portal even more. But like you said, this could be year-to-year -year basis. I think the NCAA is trying something out right now, and we'll just see how it goes. All right, we're going to take a break here. We've got some tweets coming in. We'll take a time out here, 38 minutes after the hour. We appreciate the questions from the studio audience. We are live here at the Turkey Leg Shack at 1412 Washington Street here in beautiful downtown Vicksburg. A lot to talk about. We'll talk about the donations, uh, obviously doing some fundraising for the basketball program. The SWAC will change in about, what, five hours and 20 minutes as we'll have two schools coming in, Bethune and FAMU. The SWAC schedule is going to change. We have a new travel partner. We'll talk about that and what we can expect there. So a lot to unpack, and we'll get to it on the other side of this one-minute timeout. We'll be right back. Load up the family and head to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Vicksburg has so much to offer, from beautiful parks to one-of-a-kind restaurants with astounding food and breathtaking views. And of course, around every corner, there's fun waiting for you. Come visit Vicksburg and see for yourself why it's not only called the key to the South, but you can also call it home. Vicksburg, Mississippi, a fun place to visit, a great place to live. Don't worry, 74 people were picked before me in the NFL Draft. To fight childhood obesity, United Way and the NFL are helping kids play at least 60 minutes a day. Okay, time for the Team Obstacle Course. Yay! 
What this place needs is more healthy kids. To get involved or donate, go to unitedway.org slash play60. Now I get it. To a special edition of the Land and Bussy radio program here in downtown Vicksburg at the Turkey Leg Shack. It's a, you know, we talk about a place, Turkey Leg Hut. Everybody associates that in Houston. That people talk about that. But uh, the Turkey Leg Shack here in downtown Vicksburg, 1412 Washington Street, where they have a weekday all-you-can-eat, all-you-care-to-eat buffet. And uh, they actually post a video right before they open of what they're going to serve every weekday. So you get a chance to see what, uh, what you're checking out. So we appreciate everyone coming out and uh, supporting. Speaking of support, Landon Bussy, we talked about it uh, leading in, donations, uh, your fundraising. That's a big part of, of what you got going, and obviously for all sports amongst these tough times, trying to get back on our feet here. Just talk about the, the support from the alumni as you as you try to s get out and about and, and talk to folks. Oh, I appreciate all the support that I've been giving since I arrived um, to Oakhorn um, by the alumni, the, the administration, the fans, and everyone. Um, and I appreciate all the donations that have been given. Um, of course, we have um, somewhere here right now um, to collect donations that we are willing to give, but I appreciate all the support and the effort that you know everyone tried to do to make me feel comfortable at home. Yeah, just talk about the support from the alums. You've been here a little over a year, year and change, coming in from uh, Houston. You talk about that matriculation in uh, different location. Everything's different. Just talk about the support you received. Oh, I've received a lot. Um, it's a, you know, a lot different, you know, from where I've been. Wherever you go, it's going to be different, but the support has been there. Everyone reaching out, congratulating me, um, just sending me messages at the end of the game, or if it's Facebook or Twitter or any type of social media platform, um, you know, just, you know, just telling me, keep pushing. If you lose a game, just sending encouraging words, um, just being very supportive. You are active on social media. You're on Twitter and, you know, you tweet a lot of different stuff. You're, you're pretty active on social media. How important is that in uh, getting the word out these days? I guess it's I guess it's the norm. I guess it's required almost. Yeah, especially for the you know the young guys um, that you recruit and things like that. They want to see if you're active and um, see if you know what's going on in the world. So um, it's important just to be active and you know communicating with the your social media platform and things like that, so you can still be engaged and in tune about what's going on. So for people who want to donate give us some information in terms of how they can. Um, if you want to donate, um, of course, you can go to the um, Oakhorn State um, Athletic page and go to um, donations and Oakhorn State Foundation Men's Basketball. We have somebody in the back right there um, who has a receipt book that who accept the donations as well. For those who want to call and get more information, what, what number do they need to call? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Off the top of my head, I do not know. And you have your assistant coach here, uh, Coach Adams, talk a little about him and the job that he's done. Um, Coach Adams, um, he's from Brandon, Mississippi, who played at Georgetown, um, who done a great job of just uh, recruiting um, in-state kids, um, what he was hired here to do. Um, he's just been a huge impact, you know, for this program, um, development of post players, just um, handling a lot of different things, um, paperwork and things like that around campus and things like that. But he has just done an unbelievable job with the recruiting. Um, helping us lock down a lot of Mississippi kids and um, future players who are recruiting right now that hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on. And for Coach Adams, I mean, I, he's done a nice job in terms of the travel and logistics and having to do this stuff on the fly. I mean, on a typical year, it's kind of easy, but this year it was extremely difficult. Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, it was difficult for everyone, but I think that he did a good job just adapting, um, you know, just learning on the fly, being at, you know, this is his first year been a division one assistant coach and he did an amazing job just adapting and um, dealing with COVID and just trying to you know get these players to um, buy in as well and you know learning me learning the culture learning the system um, just learning on the fly really helped him out and really helping him um, with his career in the coaching business. You, know, you, you talked about uh, you talked about compliance and just what uh, Mr. Russ who does a great job with athletic compliance with COVID-19 and all the moving parts and all the moving pieces and eligibility and transfer rules and all of that, what, what, what are some of the pitfalls that you, know, that you have to kind of watch out for? Are things changing? Are things going to get back to normal, you think? You know, with, with COVID, things have changed, but then there's some always some good stuff on the other side that you uncover that, that have to get better. Uh, we, we've learned that already throughout the course of life here in this last 15, 16 months. What has changed? What will improve, you think, 
uh, once we get on the other side of this stuff? Uh, what changes have been, one thing is the recruiting calendar. Um, we finally was able to go out recruiting this past weekend. Um, but we haven't been able to go out recruiting in, in over a year. So that's one thing that changed. Also, the in-person. Um, we haven't had a chance to really have, you know, official visits and things like that and up until the start of June. So just the in-person, actually going out to see a recruit, to see a PSA, um, to talk to them, the home visits, the um, official visits, unofficial visits, um, that would really change due to COVID, you know, just the in-person and they try to limit the contact. So it was just been really, you know, hard just trying to make sure you identify the right type of kids who can come in and believe in this program and help impact. How tough was it for you to, to get these kids, you know, via Zoom and just having to deal with it that way? Because you said you like to be in the gym, you like to face to face. It was tough, but like I said, being that we recruit a lot of kids close to the home and um, Coach Adams had a relationship with, you know, former players and coaches and things like that to assist that, um, I think that was very helpful. But being that you didn't have the opportunity to really go see other person, and it wasn't um, face to face and with Zoom, it was phone calls and just networking and relationships and knowing this person, knowing that person, it was pretty tough because um, I'm more of a face to face guy. I know you you play these games back in your mind a lot. H how uh, how often have you thought about this season and just some of the games? We lost some close games, we had some close shaves, and talking with you and just your body language. I know you replayed some of these games in your mind countless times, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we let a lot of games slip away. Um, we let a lot of games slip away, and I think that this upcoming year we'll do a better job of closing out games. Um, we'll do a better job of just, you know, putting more points on the board. I think, like I said, we struggle with that. But, you know, there's a few games that really, you know, still stick out to me to our, where I feel as though that we could have closed out a little better. We could win that game here, a possession here, a possession there. Um, free throw missed, free throw missed here, layup missed here. You know, bad possession on defensive end, get up, giving up an offensive rebound. Um, I feel as though we just didn't do a good job of closing our game. And I think the next year I'll put my team in this better situation to be successful. And the fans have been great coming out to the, uh, the Whitney Arena. And the, the, one of the questions that's come in is, what can fans and what can alums do for you, Coach? What can the Alkanites do for you to help you and your program as you uh, progress here in year two? I think the biggest thing is just coming out to the game support, um, getting that fan base up. That's my thing. That's the only thing I'm really pushing for right now is um, getting the fans to come down. I think we've only have um, eight home games this year. Um, I would like to, you know, try to fill up the arena for those eight games. I really would. So that's the biggest thing right now is trying to get the fan base to come out and support um, and have fun at the games and hopefully that we put on a show. And there will be a show. You got two new teams coming into the conference officially, July 1, Bethune Cookman and Florida AM. The SWAC schedule has changed. We have a new travel partner. Didn't know that till a couple of weeks ago, and I got a chance to look at the SWAC schedule. So we'll talk about that. Any questions from the studio audience? We will get to that on the other side of this timeout. Glad you can join us. We appreciate everyone coming out. And uh, there are d'oeuvres here after this is over with. I'll be indulging in that, Coach. We'll take a break. We'll be right back after this timeout from the Turkey Leg Shack located here at 1412 Washington Monday, Street. Auckland State University was founded in 1871 by the state of Mississippi in efforts to educate the newly freed slaves. Alcorn is the first public historically black land grant institution in the United States and the second oldest state supported institution of higher learning in Mississippi. Founded in 1871, uh, named after James L. Alcorn by Hiram Revels, who served as the first president. It was originally called Alcorn AM. We have a lot of great people that's come from Alcorn. You got Megger Wiley Evers, you have Donald Driver, Steve McNair, Merle Evers, who is my soror. We have just a bunch of people, Alex Haley, and um, who, of course, wrote Roots. So it's a lot of rich history here. We're one of the first institutions in the United States for, that was geared for black people, or as, as we call it, HBCU. So that's really a great accomplishment. Here at the Turkey Leg Shack, located here in downtown Vicksburg. Glad you can join us here as basketball season will be starting before you know it. We'll be talking about the basketball schedule, the SWAC schedule, 
And uh, let's talk about non-conference, Coach. We had a lot of games away from home, obviously, teams across the country. We're playing some of the top teams in the country. You open up, I believe, on the West Coast, Gonzaga and Washington State. Just talk a little bit about your, your schedule as we get it cranked up here in a few months. Yeah, we're playing three Final Four teams um, this year, and that's Gonzaga, Baylor, who won the national championship, and University of Houston, who also was in the Final Four. But we open up with Washington State, then we play Seattle, then we play Portland State, and then we go play Gonzaga. I think we come back home for a little bit. I think then we play Wichita State, then Tulsa, then University of Houston, then Oklahoma, then Minnesota. Um, we got a rough schedule, but I do think that, you know, we are for the challenge. Uh, we have two to three more games we got to find, but we have a rough schedule, but I do, do to think that my guys are for the challenge. The obvious question, will there be any home games on the friendly confines of the Davey Whitney Arena? As of right now, no. We'll open up, I think we open up with Texas Southern on January the 10th, I believe, or Perry if you one of them. Um, I think it's January the 10th, but that'll be our first home game. Like I said, we don't have many home games. Um, that's why I just you know, really want to get the support of the alumni to come down for those eight home games that we do have, and hopefully we can get um, just a little more support. All right, we have a question uh, from the studio audience. Hey, how you doing? Um, in addition to winning the championship, does your team have other goals, and what are they? Of course, one of the main goals is um, academics. Uh, we want to hold out. We want to have a team GPA of 3.0. Um, also, we want to have a 100% graduation rate. So that's one of the most important things for our athlete is come from the academic standpoint. And I try to um, instill in my athletes and hold them accountable um, just as far as when it comes to uh, academics. So that's what that's our main goal. I appreciate that question. And one of the big questions that once we get into conference play, you talked about that, come tonight at midnight, Bethune and Florida a and will officially join the conference. I believe Commissioner McClellan is in Tallahassee. They had sort of a big event to kind of kick off uh, Florida A&M joining the conference. So, for, we're, and the SWAC schedule's changed, by the way. We're not going to play, uh, I believe, and I looked at the schedule, the Alabama teams, home and home. We're going to go this year to Alabama, but next year uh, they'll be coming to us. But we go to Florida. Bethune, Cookman, and Florida A&M will be a road trip and instead of Southern University being our travel partner, Jackson State will be our travel partner. Uh, that will be the next change. Grambling and Southern will be travel partners and we'll be the travel partners with uh, Jackson State. So definitely an interesting dynamic there, Coach. And just talk about FAMU and Bethune and what that means as far as the excitement of uh, SWAC basketball. Um, it's exciting. Um, get opportunity to play against two new schools, FAMU and Bethune, um, who's coming in from the MEAC. Um, who's coming in, who's got to learn the swag, who's going to have to learn the routes and things like that. But it's exciting to get two new teams, get opportunity to go to Florida uh, for my athletes to experience going to Florida. Um, and just the opportunity to, uh, you know, to play those guys. Um, but Thome has a really good program and so does FAMU. Um, so it's going to be exciting to see what they bring to the table and um, see how they impact in the swag. You know, uh, the question about student athletes and academics, you know, 47, I believe, 47 student athletes got their degrees. And uh, Jail Scott, who was who played basketball here, was your manager, got his degree. You know, talk about how they were able to, your players were able to handle the academics amongst the challenges of COVID-19 with the cancellations and additions, the different travel plans and, and all of that, how they were able to stay focused in the classroom. Um, I just think that our um, academics and our compliance department did a great job of just assisting with that um, and just helping us as far as just communicating with professors um, and letting them know what's going on. If we're out for, for a role game, if our team was hit with COVID or whatever the case may be, and the professors, they were very helpful with us to just make sure our student athletes stay on, stay on top of their grades. And of course, compliance is always a big key to that. Is that Mr. Russ here? Is, is, is he yeah, here? Mr. Russ, I think Mr. Russ is here. I think Ms. Smith is here. I can't see Ms. Cook. She's somewhere. Okay. I think they're back. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's give those folks a, a round of applause for the job that they've done <laughs> in what's a very challenging year. And I, I, I don't say this too often, but I can say it now, just the student athletes overall in all sports, what they had to go through uh, this, past season. It's something that we've learned from and uh, hopefully we can get this done on the other side. And speaking of that, Coach, we saw this 
with the, the Baseball World Series, a team had to exit due to some COVID issues. What are you hearing? What are some of the guidances? Is it too early to even talk about that in terms of what we can expect? Uh, we had a bunch of cancellations, uh, non-conference this past season. Anything that's gonna change? Vaccinations, will they be required? Uh, well, what, what, what are you hearing there? Um, I don't think they're gonna be required, but um, they are rec highly recommended um, for our student athletes and um, player personnel and the coaches and you know for the get vaccinated. Um, I think the NCAA is really recommending that to help um, have a successful season so we won't have so many shutdowns and we can keep everybody healthy and out of harm's way. I can just tell you just I was in the arena twice during conference play in which I was setting up equipment and the game was canceled right then and there just setting up <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> what game was that? That was Grambling? Uh, it was I think it was Tech, Texas Southern I believe a home game and then I was in Huntsville. I was uh, getting ready to talk to the AD and uh, I was in his office setting up a meeting and walked out on the gym floor and the assistant coach said, you know, the game's been canceled, COVID-19 issues. And uh, that was tough. But yeah, uh, Alabama A&M. Alabama A&M, yeah. Uh, yep, in Huntsville, that game did get shut down right before the game. And that was a time in which we had beat Bama State two days earlier mm -hmm. and you were really looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, how we we're gonna do against a pretty good A&M team, a uh, tough team to beat there. Absolutely, I was looking forward <laughs> to it, but. It happened. We can we can laugh about it a little bit. We really can't, but it's just just a matter of us doing what we need to do to. You know, hopefully, we don't have a lot of that co coming up. I think it'll be much better this year. Um, I think COVID slowed down a little bit. I do think the vaccination is helping out. So, hopefully, we'll have a full season. Well, after the fourth, I believe the student athletes will be coming back. Talk a little bit about your schedule now as we get to the second half of the summer. Um, July the 6th when all the student athletes they'll, they'll return and we're going to hit the ground running. Uh, we'll have COVID testing um, and that following day we're going to start up with um, some intensity workout. Um, our strength conditioning coach, they've been great to us and helpful with us and they're going to you know get the guys in the weight room, get them stronger, get them bigger and my job is to get them better, more, get them better on the court. So that's the plan. So starting Ju July the 7th will be the first day they move in on the 6th and we'll start up on the 7th. Have you had, I'm sure you've had Zoom meetings with them in terms of what they've been doing and that you get a sense of where they are condition wise or does it really matter? Once they get here, it all starts over. Um, I think my, I think the return is no. Um, better to come back to you out of shape and make yourself look bad. Um, my returners know how practice is going to be. They know the expectations, what it's going to be in the weight room um, with Coach Q and strength conditioning and staff. Um, so I do believe that my return is no and what to expect. So I do think that they, they have been working out. Um, I think I can trust them to do some type of work. But I do think that, you know, the new guys is going to be a little culture shock to them just coming in on um, what to expect, the intensity, how we want to practice, how we want to play, how we want to just um, transition for everything. So I think that they're going to um, take a little time to adjust. But my return is they, they know that um, I think they're smart about it. <laughs> not to come back too out of shape. Is it safe to say you're going to be going 100 miles an hour from day one? Oh, no, not, not day one. We're going <laughs> to work, work them in. Day two? Nah, nah. <laughs> 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 I ain't about to answer that question. <laughs> but no, I, I don't think that, no, we're not going to, I mean, like I said, my return is they're going to lead the way. Um, they know what we're going to do, pretty much the same thing. Um, and they know they need to come back in some type of shape. But uh, we don't want to have any injuries or anything like that. So yep. we're going to work them in. Um, after that first week, we, we're going to turn it up a little bit. Um, it's their job to try to stay in shape. Um, they say all of them say they want to be professional basketball players. So you got to do what you got to do on the off season. Take care of your body, eat right, and um, you know, continue with activities. Coach Landon Bussey joining us. We appreciate everyone coming out. Give yourselves a round of applause here. <laughs> Coach, I thank you for this opportunity and looking forward to doing it again. All right, sounds good, thank you. That'll do it for the Land and Bussy program. Glad you can join us however way you might have joined us listening and or watching here on 91.7 WPRL and WPRL.org. Our producer, Jamario Brooks, Cedric Tillman, our producer. I'm Charles Edmond. We appreciate you joining us. We'll talk to you soon. So long.